of KLAQ and uh, 733. One of the most famous El Pasoans ever to live. I mean, a guy that's not only famous in El Paso, but world famous all over, not the country, all over the world is uh, private investigator J.J. Arms. Yes. Who's here with us today. And uh, Jay Jr. is here as well. Hi, Mr. Arms. How are you today? I'm doing fine. In addition to the pri- hey Jay, how are you? Good morning. Good how to are see you, you, buddy. How are you doing? In addition to the being a private investigator, you spent years on the the city, the El Paso City Council. I spent uh, four years at um, the city council, and uh, the business is still is still going strong. Investigation is still uh, keeping you busy. Still, uh, we work we work worldwide, all over the world. Wow. We take the cases that uh, nobody else can solve. Right. Don't you have some kind of guarantee that you give people, don't you? Or you, you tell them when you're working with me, you don't, you don't work with anybody else. You do things my way. Why yeah. don't you explain that to us? That's correct. Well, you know, I had to be different than all the other private investigators. I, I guarantee my work. I don't uh, solve the uh, case. I, I don't get paid, even though they can put their money up front. And uh, uh, I, I take the case and I only take the... Uh, uh, most difficult cases that the city police, the county police, uh, the FBI can't solve. And uh, because, you know, people don't know too much about private investigators. City police, any law enforcement agency, don't take uh, an in- interest in any case unless there is a crime. And uh, because uh, they uh, they enter into the case after the ca- crime is committed. I enter into the case before the crime is committed Mm -hmm. and I can prevent a crime from being committed if I am retained before the crime is committed. Give give me an example of what somebody, you know, not, you don't have to be specific, but some, some, somebody might come to you and, and how you could prevent a crime before it takes place. They say, uh, Mr. Arms, um, we've got some warnings and we've got some threats. And, uh, I think that, uh, they're going to follow up with the threats. And I called the police and they told me that, they could not enter into the case unless they had already committed a crime. So what I do, I take the case and we set surveillance and on, on the subject and uh, uh, prevent the crime from being committed. Uh, one example. Uh, do, you, do you at any point speak to the person you're surveilling or do you just watch them and, and see what they do? No, you... we watch them yeah. until they... Uh, uh, they're in the act of committing a crime, and we stop it. And uh, uh, if they're armed, we we disarm them and call law enforcement. How did you become a private investigator? I guess some private investigators had some kind of background in police work. How, how did you enter the field of private investigation? By mistake. <laughs> <laughs> By mistake. Cause I I always wanted to be uh, a professional, and my father always instilled in me that uh, whatever you do, son, I want you to be the best, not the second best. And uh, uh, I was very good with my hands. And uh, at the age of 11, I lost my hands on a, uh, in an accident that this uh, person uh, by the name of Richard Caples uh, brought these uh, boxes. Uh, you, box- you were boys at the time, weren't you? I was 11. Yeah. Okay. I was 11. Mm-hmm. He was 18. He brought a box of railroad torpedoes, and he he told me, he says, open the box and take two of those dynamite caps out. And he says, and uh, he says, break the seal. And he says, if you rub them together, they'll sparkle. Uh huh. And so, well, they did more than sparkle. They did more than sparkle. <laughs> they, uh, when I uh, opened the box and, and took the two dynamite caps out, took, broke the seal, and I barely touched them together and they blew up and uh uh it just i it blew me away 20 feet from the point of impact oh my and i fell right close to a little tree and uh i uh i looked at the tree i was trying to prop myself up from the tree Uh my hands were blown to pieces at Mm -hmm. the wrist both Mm -hmm. of them it 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 seems almost like a miracle that you survived that well, the, the Lord acts in mysterious ways, yeah. and I said, I guess he's got a, another plan for me, and I didn't give up. Uh, when I was uh, out of surgery, uh, I was at the uh, Hotel Du Hospital, and uh, had just come out of surgery. My hands were all, all uh, taped up, and 
and uh, I knew that they were gone because I had heard the doctor talking about uh, telling my dad uh, we're going to amputate about two inches above the wrist. And so I knew by this time that my hands were gone. So I looked up in the sky and there was a skylight uh -huh. at this uh, uh, about surgery. And I looked at the sky and the sky was real ugly and the clouds were kind of fighting each other. And uh, so I asked the Lord, because I've always been close to the Lord. I asked the Lord, why me, Lord? And we're so selfish that I, I really meant, why didn't you take my friend's hands away mm -hmm. instead of me? And Well, that, that seems like a fair question to the Lord, because he was the guy whose idea it was in the first place, right? <laughs> it was. Yes, but let me tell you, so, so when I realized what I had said, and I said, dear Lord, it wasn't you that took my hands. It was the devil. And when I said that, all the uh, clouds that I was looking at, uh, they cleared up and it got the real bright. And uh, and that's the way that my life has been ever since. Mm -hmm. real bright. You uh, Did you imagine at the time, in the days following that, the months following that, that you, you would be able to to do the things with your with your prosthetic hands that you you can do now did you i didn't did, realize that mm -hmm. when when the doctor and i came home from the hospital the doctor says well uh we're gonna have put we're gonna put jay in the hospital we're sending him up to uh east coast and he's going to be there for about a year to learn to use the prosthetics and and uh so it's going to be it's going to be kind of hard and uh i said no i don't want to go anywhere i'll learn here so i i asked my um uh, parents, I said, well, uh, as soon as I, my hands heal up, my uh, stumps heal up, I, I want to go to school. And 27 days later, 27 days later, I was ready to go to school. After the accident. After the accident. Wow, that's wow. amazing. And yeah. So 27 days later, if I'm talking too much, you tell me. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's fascinating. It's really fascinating. So then uh, when I was ready to go to school, um, I, I was there at class. And uh, right before, could you write? Could you use no, a pencil? Yeah, could you do I learned, that? I learned. I was working day and night to be able to learn to uh, to learn how to use the prosthesis. The prosthesis, and uh, first I would grab a glass of water, and I would just barely get it to my to my mouth, and it would drop automatically. And uh, I would pick up a pencil to try to write, and uh, it I would just scribble. So anyway, I, I learned. I was very determined. So I stayed day and night learning, and I learned to be able to go to school. I wanted my education. So then when uh, uh, I was ready to go to school the first day, and as before, we used to go, uh, before we went to class, we used to go and play football, you know, mm -hmm. looking, uh, right there at the school and throw passes and catch passes. And so I did the same thing the day first day. All the kids, hey, nice to see you, nice to see you. And uh, I said, can I play with you guys? Sure. So they were throwing passes, and I was catching the passes and all that. <laughs> and uh, so when uh, the bell rang and I got ready to go, go into class, we went into class, and everybody was greeting me. And uh, the teacher said, I want Jake to, uh, to sit up here in front. Uh, I closed my desk. And uh, so... Uh, I was sitting there, and uh, the teacher said, uh, it was Mrs. Shannon at uh, Isleta Elementary, and I, she said, uh, uh, we're all going to the class. We're going to do the, the, uh, our uh, class on the board today, mm -hmm. uh, everybody except Jay. And I said, teacher, why not? Why not me? Oh, well, whenever you get ready uh, to, to, uh, to write and all that, well, I can do that now. She was probably looking out for you, didn't she? Uh, you know, didn't, want, yeah. didn't want you to embarrass yourself, but, but you were ready to go. Yes, it was. She was very sympathetic. And so I went up there with the kids and I was writing uh, our, our work. That's so cool. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, one of the kids nods me and she says, Hey, the teacher and the principal are right in back of you. So I turned around. Sure enough, my teacher was there, Mrs. Shannon. And you could see the. She had tears in her eyes, mm -hmm. rolling down her cheek. And uh, the principal says, hey, uh, Jay, you're not ready to come to school yet. I said, yes, I am. <laughs> well, apparently you were. <laughs> yeah. I said, yes, I am. He said, no, you're not. I said, look at the floor. 
I looked at the floor. There was a big old puddle of blood from uh, from where your prosthetics were bleeding. Is that no? What, was what happened is I had, I had busted all the stitches oh. off of my stumps, and they had uh, started bleeding down my elbow. Uh -huh. And when I was riding onto the floor, onto the floor, uh, my. Uh, my, uh, my arm was bleeding, and I had a big old puddle of blood. You weren't aware of it until I wasn't aware of it until Football. they brought it to my attention. Class. Is that what had happened? It had, it had, it had when happened I was for playing football. football. Okay. Yeah, I was catching passes and all that. So anyway, uh, so the principal said, "Bring the custodian over so you can uh, mop this blood." And so he came over with a with a, a mop. bucket and and a mop and all that. So I took the the mop away from him. And I start mopping my own blood. Mm -hmm. It seems crazy. like you wanted to let everybody know without saying it that hey, you, that, you hey, aren't going to be held back. You were going to hey, do everything. Could do it. Right. You could do it yourself. Correct. And you wanted to let them know it from the very beginning, That's the first right. time you went back to school. Right. So anyway, I mopped the blood and the principal said, I can't believe this. I can't believe it. So he said, you go back to the, to the doctor and don't come back to school until he brings uh, gives you a letter that you're ready uh, to come to school. Uh -huh. But sure enough, I went that my I went that day back home and we went to the doctor and I told the doctor, oh yeah, geez, let's see, let's see what happened here. So all the stitches were, were busted, you know. He said, what are you what were you doing? I said, well I was I was catching some passes, yeah. you know. Playing some football playing, just playing like football. any kid would. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, when uh, uh, he stitched me up again as a doctor, I want I want you to write a letter and say that I'm ready to go to school. Well, I think we better. No, I said, I, I will. Uh, and I won't, I won't play football. So then it's okay. So he gives me a letter. Next day I was there with a letter. For, uh, and I went to the principal's office. The, uh, the principal said, what would you do to bribe the, uh, the, the principal to, to write this letter? I said, no, sir. I just told him <laughs> that I was not going to play football and that uh, I was going to behave. And uh, so anyway, uh, I went back to class, and uh, of course, uh, they set me right there by the by the, by the teacher's desk. And uh, when the bell rang, everybody ran uh, ran up to because I was the first one out to open the door for me. Wow. And so what I did, I would close the door, and then I would open it with my prosthesis. Right. Oh. And I didn't say anything, but what I was telling everyone, hey. I can do it. It kind of, it makes sense when I think about it because if you got used to people always holding doors for you, mm -hmm. you get used to that. You people will be holding doors for you the rest of your life. That's but if right. you let them know, hey, I'm going to do this. Let me bring Jay Junior into the conversation okay, here please. for just a second. Jay, uh, when did you start working with your dad? Was that something you always dreamed about doing when you were a kid? You know, ironically, um, I was I was literally born into the business, so I grew up seeing my dad going, you know, to work every day coming home late at night, he'd be gone for weeks or months on end, you know, in foreign countries, you know, working on kidnapping cases or murder cases. And so I, I don't know if I was conditioned to, uh, to be in this business well, or it's a pretty cool job. Yeah. Right? If it just, for a it kid just, to see their dad do it, isn't it? Yeah. It sparks up inside me. And that's something that, uh, I couldn't think of doing anything else when I was growing up. I could not wait. Why did you prepare to join your dad in his business? I mean, what kind of things did you do? Well, I mean, I would go, some of my earliest childhood memories are going on surveillance in the back seat of my dad's car, you know, sometimes wow. with his permission, a lot of times without his permission, because yeah. I was supposed to be in school the next day. So, you know, I'd see him getting, you know, he'd rush home after working all day. And he'd rush home to grab some dinner because he had to go back out and do surveillance by himself or with the guys. You'd sneak in the back of the and car. I'd sneak in the back of the car and wait. Uh, until he was too far away from the house to turn around and come right. back, <laughs> take me back home. And I'd end up doing surveillance with him. Probably, you know, a lot of times I would fall asleep, you know, I was <laughs> too young, but um, those are my earliest memories. And then um, when I was 18 years old, my senior year of high school, I was simultaneously going to his investigators training academy. So I graduated high school in May and I graduated from his training academy in June and I was licensed by the state at 18. Oh, sweet. The, he probably uh, realized, uh, hey, we could kind of accelerate you, Jay. You, you, know, you know most of this stuff just from watching <laughs> the old man, right? 
pretty much. <laughs> now, tell me a little bit. Either one of you could uh, talk about this. Are there work? There talk about doing a movie about your life, Mister Arms. Yes, sir. There's been through the years. There's been a lot of offers from producers in California, producers in New York, producers overseas, sending us um, uh, offers to work in different films and all that. Um, Lenny Freeman, who was the uh, creator of um, Hawaii Five O, took an interest. He had read an article about me in some magazine, and uh, so uh, he flew me into uh, uh, California and said, "I am going to uh, prepare you to star in one of my uh, films. Uh, my television series is called uh, Hawaii Five O with Jack Lord." with Jack Lord. So then uh, he says, and uh, after that, uh, we'll see what uh, what kind of work you can do. It was a famous appearance, wasn't it? That's when, correct. When you were on, and it was more than one appearance on the show. Oh, yes. Uh, there was one appearance, but it was the only episode in the history of the original Hawaii 5 series that's been remade. And oh. the guy that remade it was Peter Weller, the guy that was oh, the original Robocop. Robocop. And he actually played the J.J. Arms character. The the character, just, you know, for a character on a show, now, is that what the, your action figure is, your character from the show, or the action figure they made of you, or is that from your life? No, that's from my life. That's the, you. Okay. Well, that, thereafter, oh. thereafter, after Hawaii Five O, I I started getting all kinds of offers from all over, and I started getting, because I played the part of uh, an assassin, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I shot and killed... 15 police officers and on the show. <laughs> on the show. Hey, Jay, I was going to say, Jay, that's, that's quite make, a lot. Make sure on that we jump show. in here. Yes, on yes, the yes. show. Only in the show. Yeah, yeah, people, then I started getting criticized. Sometimes. I started getting criticized from all over saying, this man has really adapted himself with his prosthesis and he's an expert in martial arts and all that. And uh, to to be able to be pick, depict uh, as an assassin, that's terrible. And uh, now were these people that were kind of like uh, from all uh, over. the disabled rights people oh, no, saying, no. no, 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 just regular people from all over. So then uh, I, I would I would have to explain that. So, well, that's the way they, they wanted to show the dexterity in my prosthesis where I put this gun together and uh, and then I used it to uh, as revenge because I depicted a person that had to they went to rob a bank. Before I lost my hands, uh -huh. I depicted a person that went to rob a bank, and, uh, and I had this uh, note saying, "If you don't give me the money, uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll explode I, this this bomb and it'll blow up the bank." And uh, well, when they they got they got the note, immediately they called uh, McGarrett, and that was uh, McGarrett was the police. Uh, uh, agent in Hawaii Five O. That was uh, Jack Lord's character. Jack right. Lord, Jack Lord, and uh, Dano. Dano, book him, Dano. <laughs> book him, Dano. That, right? <laughs> right. So then, what uh, what happened is that they got there. They got there before I exploded the uh, the uh, dynamite bomb, uh -huh. and uh, and they captured me. So I was sent to prison uh -huh. in, in the movie. I was sent to prison for, uh, I was given 10 years. But you plotted yeah, your but revenge. When they, yeah, when they captured him, the explosives went off and blew off just his hands. So that was the motivation for him. The whole time he was in prison, he was thinking about, how am I going to get even with my Garrett and all the police officers that caused me to lose and my hands? And you came out as an evil, twisted man, and you wanted right. to kill police yeah. officers. All right. So I, my strategy was to uh, get all the officers that were involved in my incarceration and uh, in and my uh, target was also a Garrett. So all, all through the movie, and they, uh, the at, at that time, and uh, Lenny Freeman told me that the show was going going downhill. And when this episode came up, I really accelerated the the uh, ratings. Oh, it was the a big, listen. You have no idea. You know, back in those days, there were three networks. So <laughs> exactly. when it was a big show, everybody exactly. saw. You know, you were watching. 150 different television shows. You you were watching this. And this was, was my CTV then. Yeah, sure it was. <laughs> how, how about, uh, we got a break, Mondo? Mr. Arms, I want to take a yes. break. Thank and you. then come back and talk to you a little bit more. Thank you. Former El Paso City Councilman. Uh, and just one of the most famous uh, people from El Paso uh, ever. 
I think, you know, you, you make a short list there of people whose, whose fame really is worldwide. You got Don Haskins, you got, uh-huh. you got, uh, JJ arms, me, and that. <laughs> <laughs> You're just some guy on the radio. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, uh, J arms jr. Is here as well. Uh, now they've talked about making a movie about your life, I guess for years and years, Mr. Arms, but, but, uh, it's important that they portray you take creative license. That of course exactly. happens, but you want to be portrayed. Give me an example of what they've wanted to put in movies before that you, well, you were not okay. With. They, they put me under contract. I've got uh, uh, retainers up to $200,000 up front. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, they wrote us, they wrote a script and of course they, they have creative license. And so they depicted this J arms as being very successful going through uh, uh, going to nightclubs and kissing and <laughs> kissing all the girls and, and, and that's all. Not well that's you. what a secret that's what a secret agent so I know you're yeah, not a secret not agent but the that, bad part but it gets worse <laughs> anyway, okay the kissing the girl part the I'd be, I'd be okay with okay. that so what anyway, else did they want to do Mr. Arms they, then they would depict Jay Arms with a briefcase and in his briefcase you'd open the briefcase and there was a bottle of whiskey and then there was a, some uh, bottles of uh, some uh, of pills and I would say, what is this for? Oh, yeah, those are supposed to be uppers and downers. And 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 I said, no, 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 I don't drink. I don't take dope. Oh, no, that's human interest. Uh, that it makes people want to see that. Yeah. And they want to make you like a like uh, uh, that you have demons, right? You know, exactly. which which it, it doesn't seem like you do. You do none of that. You don't even drink, right, Mr. I don't, Jones? I don't. Right. I don't drink. But they want to make it a more complicated. Yes. Yeah, so I'm not, said, not no. saying you're simple, but <laughs> yeah, well, there's good, there's good complicated and there's bad complicated. Right. And so then I would say, no, I'm sorry, I won't I won't do that. But Jay, uh, you wrote uh, you signed this contract. I signed the contract, but I'm not going to be. Uh, exploit exploit it this way. You don't want to be portrayed as a druggie and or somebody who I had to don't. rely on alcohol. To, I don't to get and, through. Yeah, well, and, that makes sense. I mean, so this is why I've been turning down a lot of uh, a lot of projects and a lot of cases. So until Warner Brothers came in, and uh, of course they put me under contract, paid me million dollars uh, to to portray uh, Jay Arms, and they had Mitch Horowitz. Uh, that wrote the, the script, and Mitch is the one that had uh, Arrested Development. Arrested Development. And, uh, of course, he spent a lot of time at, here in El Paso, and I spent a lot of time in California. And he spent three and a half years doing the script. Wow. After that, he comes out with a script that it was a joke because it had me as a, um, as a wannabe. As a, as a bumbler. Maybe. Right. Yeah. As a one well, of the, the problem that we had from the very beginning was Mitch is a, he's a comedy writer. He yeah. created Arrested Development. He wanted to make a comedy version. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Was like, kinda, yeah. yeah. He, he just had a total. And, and the, we found out later because when, when we got the script, you know, first of all, we, we told Warner Bros. Are you sure this is the right guy? You know, this is an action movie. You know what I'm saying? This is what we do. This is real life. Are you sure an, a comedy writer is the right person to write action? And they said, oh, no, he's very versatile. This is going to be his first uh, foray into the movie business. He's been in TV for years. Now mm-hmm. he wants, this is his first big movie yeah. project. So I said, okay, if that's, you know, you guys believe in him, you know, you know more than we do as far as the movie business. So we trusted him. What we didn't know is when we finally got the script, we kept, he wanted to have his concept of, of like a buddy, like a, a buddy, uh, an action, an action uh, comedy. Mm-hmm. or an action uh, film and you know action comedy is different than straight comedy action comedy is lethal weapon chris tucker and jackie chan those are all cool movies you know fun for everyone but um my sidekick was supposed to be jonah hill yeah so we kept seeing <laughs> oh, this really? character yeah. and it was we you know and, and the, the 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 sidekick had all the best parts it had all the best it was like the movie about the sidekick instead of jj arms yeah. right well we come to find out that it was Jonah Hill was a good friend of his and they shared the same agent. So he was trying to write a really good movie for Jonah, for Jonah Hill. Hill. Oh, exactly. Okay. So we're like, and then also simultaneously, he was trying to resurrect the Arrested Development Project, which is now on Netflix. It is. Yes. It yeah. has a big following. I hear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you didn't like the way that one came no, out, Mr. Nope. Arms. No. After three and a half years and after paying me 
millions. I'm, I'm not kidding you. You get to hold, keep that? For hold, yes. Yeah. <laughs> for holding, for holding, you know. And we kept saying, what is taking so long? What is taking so long? Oh, well, he's locked up in, in a room and he's just... Uh, yeah, right. don't, don't bother the master. Don't bother he's, he's at work. So, <laughs> so then, and I, as an investigator, we looked into it. You wouldn't investigate the guy making Absolutely. the movie. But <laughs> that's a good thing about years. being an investigator. <laughs> we'll was, get to the bottom of this. I would tell the president. I would tell the president. I warned brothers. This guy is a phony. He is writing. <laughs> he's writing for he's everybody else. Guys, yeah. He's mm -hmm. writing. Uh, he's not concentrating on on JR's project. Anyway, they paid him. All, just to write the script, they paid him seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Wow! And it was amazing to me how much money gets made and paid for things that you never see in a movie no, theater. They'll, they'll right? Millions of dollars to buy a script and park it just so that the, another studio so can nobody do else it. can get their hands exactly. on it. So then right. I had I had I have a good attorney up there. His name is Steve Cattleman. He, I was the only one that was the uh, smallest star. Because he he handles all kinds of stars. He he that Steve and uh, anyway. So we I said I want out of the contract. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do it. He said, Well, Jay, we might have to pay some of the money back if we uh, if you don't do it. Uh, even though we have to do that, I want out. So yeah. I got out of it, and they never they never made it. And Warner Brothers uh, were upset left the doors open. Yeah, actually, they were really cool about it, and they knew that they they had screwed up, and because we kept telling them the whole time, and they said, "Trust us, trust us. We we know the process. We we have faith in this writer." After you know everything kind of blew up, they they still wanted us to continue on so they could find another writer, and we we told them no. But um, I think you're onto something. Have keep have them come up with scripts that you don't like, and then they'll keep giving you money. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good deal well, to me. <laughs> but I didn't. I, what it wasn't about the money. Yeah. We wanted to do uh, about the truth, you know. Right. You want to do a movie uh, that has some substance, some substance, and something to do with what actually went. Tell on. the Not story. Just to, tell right. the story about this guy that uh, happened to. Uh, uh, get encountered in an accident lost his hands but he was successful after that i wanted to to zero in on the people that had never lost any of their body parts and they would say my gosh look at jay arms he can do this flying kicks and judo and and skydiving and all that uh -huh. and they uh, and the guy that's never lost anything uh he would say if jay arms can do that so can I. A lot of our that, wounded warriors get, we get letters from, from wounded warriors all the time, emails saying that, you know, a family member had given them our, my dad's book or they had uh, seen something on TV and saw my dad and, and it kind of restored their hope that they could do something with their life even though they'd lost one or more limbs. Mr. Oh, Arms, wow. I know uh, from, from interviews you've done before that you used to, and I want to know if you still do, used to practice the quick draw. You oh, yeah. know, and how to handle the gun. Oh, yeah. You spend some time every day uh, practicing right. that. You exactly. still practice every day, right? And I was on the Johnny Carson show, and uh, and uh, and uh, they they set it up, you know, and and Johnny was supposed to uh, challenge me, and he says, "Hey," uh, and he says, "Jay, uh, I understand you, you're the fastest gun in El Paso." I said, no, Johnny, no, I'm not the fastest gun in El Paso. I'm the fastest gun in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and you have no idea. I've seen it before. It is like you you blink and you miss it. He's so quick. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. And then uh and then he would he would uh he would uh uh they gave him a, a prop uh -huh. gun gun and we got back to back. Take five spaces, and he had put blanks in his. And I had put blanks in my prosthesis. I had a, a twenty-two magnum in my prosthesis, built uh, in. They're still built in. So then, and was it kind of like machine activated? Would it shoot? No, no, it don't? muscle activated. Muscle activated. Mu gotcha. Muscle activated. Oh wow! So then, uh, and and Johnny knew this, but he knew that I put blanks in there, and oh, uh, so then we were back to back, and then five. Uh, oh, uh, his five sidekick. Steps. His, his sidekick was, Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon there would say, one, two, three, four. And on the on the fifth, we turn around and Johnny fumbled all over the gun and I shot him but shot him right away. 
<laughs> yes. And after the show, I said, what, what happened, Johnny? He says, you know what? I thought, I don't know this guy. What if he didn't put a, 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 a black in there? And <laughs> he was worried the whole time. He goes, what if he, what if he said, didn't take That's why I got all some, so nervous when I turned around. I, I was fumbling all over. But it was funny. You know, Johnny's longtime producer was from El Paso. Really? Oh, yeah. Fred Rudy Tejas. Uh, Rudy Tejas, that's yeah, right. He that's came right. by. He's, he's, he was a good friend of mine. He's dead now. Yeah. He, was, he died a few years ago. But he became a real good friend of mine. And uh, he would... He would have me on his on his show mm. when uh, when he had his uh, uh, Rudy would have me on his show here. What was here Rudy? Now. What what show did Rudy Taz have? Uh, here? Five o'clock, five o'clock jump or something like that. Yeah, uh, you was, know I'm amazed. One thing I've noticed doing this interview is is the details. You never forget. It doesn't seem like you forget anybody's name. You remember? <laughs> now is that just the way you are, Mister Arms, or is it part of your your private what, investigator my mindset? Make, my my makeup that way. And I have a grandson by the name of Brandon, and he's in Lubbock right now. He's got a photographic memory. And I, I say, he's in medical school mm -hmm. at Texas Tech. Uh -huh. And I said, Brandon, if I could only have your your memory, uh, I, I would be amazing. And it's because he's got a photographic memory. Uh, I sent him for a, to a private school when, when he's growing up. And uh, uh, he could uh, memorize a book. And I, would, and I would challenge him, test him. What's on page uh, 167? And he would say, oh, yeah, that's a – and he'd recite the page. Well, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, skill very man. amazing. I'd say, Brendan, if that I could is. have that gift. Let me uh, talk a little bit about so – I think maybe your most famous case was the Marlon Brando's son Christian was kidnapped. Right. You uh -huh. got him back. Correct. Yeah. Who had kidnapped him? Was it a family member? No, or no, was no. It some, it was some bad guys? He was uh, – at, at that time, uh, uh, Brando, uh, Marlon Brando had gone through – 11 years trying to to get uh, custody of his son uh, he was, he had been married to Anna Cashfi and she was supposed to be a princess Indian princess which was a farce really because uh, she was not an Indian princess so they had been having problems and he had not never been able to get custody of his son so uh, she orchestrated a uh, a a uh, R a ransom kidnapping mm -hmm. case and got eight eight of uh, bad guys uh -huh. to kidnap uh, Christian Brando. Was she trying to get money out of, out of Mr. 000, Brando? 500000 yeah, right. And at that time, it was a lot of money. 500000 like is a $50 million right now. But uh, anyway, so they, they kidnapped him and took him away and he had been he had been uh, uh, kidnapped for five weeks but what freaked brando out is he had just finished the god filming the godfather movie and he thought the mafia might be upset at him for he didn't know that his wife was behind this he whole did screen. not and he thought well maybe the mafia doesn't like the way that they were portrayed in the godfather exactly exactly right? he portrayed the uh, don colioni and uh uh he he figured it was going to be a reprisal and that's why they kidnapped him so anyway how long did it take you to figure out that it was not the mafia? That it was, in fact, uh, a uh, kind of an inside job. Well, no, no. When I, when I re retrieved him, I located him in uh, Mexico, and it was in Baja California, uh, and there was a, a fishing village right on the long side of the ocean. And uh, when I when I took over the the case, Martin Brenner called me from California. I mean, from uh, Paris, because he was at that time he was filming the last tango in in, in Paris, and he says Jay, he already knew of me because I had met him when I had been in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and so he says Jay, I want you to work on this case. He says, my son has been kidnapped. He says I don't have too much information up here in, in Paris, but I'll be I'll be in the United States in five days. I'll I'll, I'll be finished. Uh -huh. And he says I want you to get to working on it. He hired me from up there. And uh, so, so he sent me uh, very, very little information. He uh, sent me overnight a picture of Christian and uh, small details. So what I did, I did research and went through the uh, area in, in Encino, uh, a good part of Beverly Hills, uh, and, uh, and where, where he was living. 
and I did the research. I did a neighborhood search, and then uh, this was all of the days before computers. You couldn't oh, just look people's exactly. addresses. I know that sounds like it would be hard. Probably work. a lot of legwork. It oh, seems it, like that's all it was. Yeah. So anyway, when <laughs> when I did the research, um, there was a lady uh, almost catty corner, catty corner across from uh, Anna Cash's house where a Christian Brenda was living. So then uh, I interviewed her and I told her, I said, has any unusual things happened here while before this boy was missing? And she said, well, no, it's, they had a big party. And she says, uh, they were blocking my, my driveway. Mm -hmm. And I called the police and because they were blocking my driveway. And uh, uh, so uh, there was this old, this old uh, uh, wagon, uh -huh. uh, kind of a, a red Volkswagen uh, van. And she says, I took the license number. I told the police that uh, this car is blocking my driveway. Uh, now you got a license plate number to go on. Right. Uh -huh. But you see, they had happened a few weeks before. So then I said, uh, oh, you, oh, really? Is that the only thing that happened? She said, oh, yes. But uh, I said, do you have the license number? She said, well, I threw it away in the trash. Here we go looking in the trash. And then in, 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 at that time, they were dusters. The glamorous life of a private investigator yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> really so she found that a, a little note with a license number. And I had a license number to go through. She said, by the time that uh, that the police came, the van was gone. Oh. It was about 4 o'clock in the morning. The van was gone, but I had the license. I threw it away in the trash can. We got the license. So I, working with that license, uh, I went to the port of entries, and uh, uh, I checked to see if anybody uh, by that uh, uh, license number had uh, gone across. And they said, oh, yes, there, there was a red van, and it was uh, full of hippies. Mm -hmm. ah. Well, this is early 70s, right. so hippies everywhere. Right. Probably. right. <laughs> exactly. So then uh, they um, they uh, gave me the uh, information. How did you finally use that information because, to track down where, where Christian had been Because, taken? you see, they, they would withhold a, the title of a car when any Americans were going into Mexico, and they were withholding the title of, of this Volkswagen, and they had gone across but had not returned so what i said that's where he is so i came back to el paso and uh i went in in, in a Hughes 500 helicopter that i had and uh, went into mexico and uh, i landed right there at the uh, uh, school grounds close to the mexican federal police wow and uh so i went over there and i said i would like to, for you to uh, give me a couple of officers to go with me. Uh, I'm looking for someone, but I didn't tell them who it was. I'm looking for someone that was kidnapped. Uh huh. And uh, so I, I would like to. Um, uh, I'll pay. I'll pay for for your services. And they looked at my my hands, and they said, "You came in the helicopter there. <laughs> and who, who's flying? <laughs> and who's flying? I said, well, I am." And one of the federal police says, oh, "I'm sorry, but I I don't." I don't fly in helicopters because I even get I even get uh, uh, air sick in an elevator. That was his excuse. <laughs> and then the other one says, "Oh no, I've got eleven kids, and can you imagine if I uh, I was to crash in that pedal jumper? Uh, who would take care of my kids?" They all gave me an excuse. They said, "We'll follow you." by land uh -huh. so so there you are in the helicopter uh, in the helicopter and they're following behind it they follow in the jeep and of course with bottles of tequila and yeah. all that for four days and four nights so then so i went long sides of the ocean uh and i think was, a bottle of tequila is like how donuts are to our cops that's, right. <laughs> so that's what they gotta have it right close to the uh to the uh ocean there was uh caves in 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 the uh, cliffs, in the cliffs of the uh, of, of the ocean, and uh, was that where they were hiding out? There was that's where they hide now. Ah. About uh, four days later, so then I, I flew back and I, I landed where where they were coming on this road, you know, singing and and all that, and, and I landed. I said, okay, I've got it. I've got a location. I, I've got them located. And he said, oh, oh, you did? I said, well, just have a couple of them jump in my puddle, puddle jumper, like he called it. <laughs> and uh, 
we'll we'll apprehend him. Oh no no, said, we'll follow. Will you meet us over there? Yeah. <laughs> and so they didn't want to be in that helicopter they, for even a second at all. Did they? they didn't. So anyway, what what happened was after they got uh, that they got there, and uh, I knew that I had a backup. You know, a big forty fives. They had they were carrying forty fives, and I only had uh, a. Uh, a thirty caliber, uh, uh, and rifle. you didn't know how the these fellows were armed that you were going to that had I didn't Christian know. Brando. You didn't know, didn't how, know. what they of had. Of course not. Yeah. So what I did, uh, it was early in the morning, uh, and it was just before daybreak, and I would I would go around sneaking around, and they were in sleep. Some were in sleeping bags, uh -huh. and then in some little tents in the caves. In the caves. This sounds better than any movie. This I is know, amazing. This sounds crazy. Yeah. Right. So anyway. What happened is that um, I I'd, I'd go with my carbine and I'd unzip the uh, uh, the sleeping bag. I said, okay, come on out with your hands up. And I had them lined up against the old walls of the ocean there. And uh, I lined up some uh, some w women and, and they were naked. And so I lined them up also. And uh, so I had all these people lined up because I, I had all this backup. In, in the meantime, I looked around the back the backup was not there oh no so then and i, I looked for them and i said hey uh, i've already taken care of them will you please uh uh come out here and give me give me a hand so sure and they came out with a with a 45s you know and they apprehended all all eight of them and uh on the last little the on the last uh cave i saw a little tent and I heard coughing, mm -hmm. and it was Christian Brando. There he was, and there he was, almost dying. Oh, he had my. double pneumonia. So I, I got him, got got him back on the chopper, took him to the U.S. and landed there at the international. Now, these people, I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. These people had been working for Christian Brando's mother in the abduction. Anna Cash fee. Yes. Anna Cash fee. That's right. Okay. Did she ever do any prison time for that? Because it no, seems like, you. you know, a criminal they, thing she did. They got out of hand and they ixed her out. Oh, okay. They took over and they said, they said, no, we'll kill, we'll keep the 500,000. Uh-huh. And so, so they got so out of So they double crossed. They double crossed her. her. Oh, wow. So anyway, when I got back to the uh, LA airport, uh, we, I, I landed and I went to a telephone booth and I and I said, uh, Christian, let me have your father's phone number in, in Beverly Hills. So I says he might be back by now. It was only four days. So uh, sure enough, I called and to see if he had left word or anything. And he answered, uh, uh, Martin O'Brien answered. And he says, uh, this is, I said, this is Jay Arms. Jay, he says, I'm here, just got in this morning. And he says, I've got some more information. I said, I got better than that. I said, I've got Christian with me. You got him? You got him? I said, yes, sir. And I put him on the phone. And he yelled, screamed, and cried. And uh, and he says, don't move. Tell me where you are, and we'll be there. He had a police escort, escorted him, him and his attorney uh, right there to the scene. Got there, and, and Christian was almost dying. Mm -hmm. And so they got him to a hospital, and uh, and I went with him. And I had a white shirt. I remember I had a white shirt, but the white shirt was so dirty, and it was black by the time mm -hmm. it was perspiration and all that. They crawling around in caves and what have <laughs> of you. Of course, I anyway. know. So when uh, Brando said, "Jay, uh, uh, Christian is on the respirator, and we're going to have a, a big party," as uh, says, "Let's go to the house," and. Uh, he gave me some clothes to to change because I, I had left everything at the in that chopper, and and he said we're going to party. I said all I want is sleep. All I want to go <laughs> is to sleep, and I'm not in a party mood. And uh, so and I said I want to go back. So I went back to get my chopper and, and came back to El Paso. Look and at then, that! You just were not in the mood to party. I you had done your job. Job finished. Right, and got me a check or whatever, <laughs> and I'm out of here with so his anyway, chopper. <laughs> so anyway, when uh, when uh, he paid me uh, uh, in advance, he gave me a uh, few thousand dollars in advance because I I paid those police officers a thousand dollars a piece mm -hmm. to to go with me. So that was five grand because there was five of them, 
So yeah, the, uh, the police aren't going to do in Mexico. They're not going to do police work without getting paid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, when uh, uh, I got back and then we had to go to trial uh, and I had to testify on my findings and uh, Brando was awarded permanent custody uh -huh. of the kid. Uh, and so everything went the way it sounds like the best Mr. Brando could have hoped for. Right. And we got to be, we got to be good friends because he, he called me all the time and he, he wanted me to train Christian. Uh, Christian wanted to be, as he was growing, he wanted to be a bodyguard. He wanted to be a private eye. He wanted to be, uh, Christian ended up having a very troubled life. Right. Yeah. When, after, after he got to be an adult, uh, he murdered his, his that, sister's that boyfriend. Right? Oh my. Let me tell you what happened. Uh, the boyfriend that was beating on his sister. Yeah. He, ended, he, murdered, killing he him. ended up going to prison for that. Yeah, right. Let him. me tell you what happened. So Brenda called me one night and he says, Jay, I need some help. I said, what happened? He says, uh, 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 Christian has just shot and killed a Cheyenne's boyfriend. Dad Cheyenne, Cheyenne was his daughter. Uh -huh. And his boyfriend, he says he had... Uh, the boyfriend had beaten her up, so he got a gun, went and shot him. What shall I do? I says, just call the paramedics, make sure that he is dead, and tell the truth. Did it happen at uh, in this at, compound at Mr. Brando's oh, house? Because yeah, he was yeah. living there with him. Mm. So then I says, tell him the truth. He says, No, no, I want to say that I was the one. No, no. Brando he, wanted to take the the he fall. He wanted to take the fall for oh, it. Oh wow! I says, no, no, tell him the truth. And he says, well, I've got one of the best attorneys. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, he's on he's on the air right now. Uh, Alan Dershowitz? No. No. <laughs> but anyway. Bob Shapiro. Bob Sh oh, Robert Shapiro. I got it so up. We need a break. Right. Robert Shapiro. <laughs> he says, he's been my attorney. Uh, he says, I'll, he, uh, I'll, I'll hire him and all that. So I said, don't trust him. I said, I don't trust him because I had heard of him. So that he paid him one million dollars to go represent him, yeah. and he says he's already made a deal with the judge. I said, Marlon, don't don't trust him. So when I showed up to to the hearing, uh, the judge um, made a big speech. He says, well, "All these celebrities and celebrities' kids think that they're going to get away with crimes, uh -huh. but uh -oh. I'm going to set a president." And he says. Yeah, every, everybody rises. So the prisoner arose, you know, and, and he says, Mr. Christian Brando, you murdered this um, individual, and I'm going to send you to uh, 10 years in prison. Oh, wow. And, and he had told Brando that uh, Shapiro had told Brando that it was going to be probation. Mm -hmm. And I said, don't trust him. Yeah. And when he did, he launched at... Uh, at Shapiro, and I because Marlon I was, Brando was going to throw need a break. Bob yeah. Shapiro, yeah, and I let was, me let, let me do let me take a break, Mister Old Famous Private Investigator J.J. Arms, an El Paso legend, uh, a legend in the field of uh, a private investigation. I mean, you know, uh, in the in the sixties and seventies, True Detective magazines. I think mm -hmm. one of them was actually called True Detective. Very popular magazine. They would write articles about the exploits of of uh mr arms all the time right. you'd be in there quite often in those in right, those right. magazines talking about your cases and what you've done so uh you don't see those magazines anymore i don't i don't know why <laughs> there's a magazine called it's a book really called uh watching the detectives yep and they selected the most famous investigators in the world and they started with pinkerton william j burns mm. and all of a sudden Jay Arms is in there. Yeah. I'm the only one that's alive, and uh, my son Jay is also in there. Yeah. Uh, he's holding a tiger, you know, <laughs> on a leash, and uh, and that was called uh, my that that tiger was uh, the Gemini machine. He was the lie detector that I used instead of a lie detector machine. I used Gemini as a lie detector. You would bring the tiger out to my office, yes, and uh, people would be sitting there in your office, and, and they would. Boy, I'd get the truth out of it. Uh -huh. Believe me, I, got, I have some. In fact, I will send you uh, a, um, uh, it's a uh, video. It's not a video. It's a, uh, uh, of a case that I broke uh, when this federal agent hired me to, because somebody stole his, his 
service revolver and his, there's his machine so, gun and all that. Yeah, his and I got department issued weapons. Oh, okay. You're not supposed to lose those things. Yeah. To, <laughs> you get in big trouble. So got, he he had to come to you. It to was get a burglary. That. They had broken into his home. Yeah. And, and I got everything. And I received. I retrieved everything. Look at that. With uh, the aid of uh, my tiger. Tell me uh, what you did for John Lennon. When John oh, Lennon was was alive, and this what, was when he was living in New York City, I believe. Right, right and now. he was uh, uh, he was uh, living with Yoko Ono. Mm -hmm. Yoko Ono had a, a son by the name of Julian. Mm-hmm. And uh, they uh, Yoko's sons. Hold, let me get this straight. John Julian was John's son with another woman. Stepson. No, no, no. Julian was John's son. The stepson was Sean. Sean. Yeah, there you Sean. go. Right. Sean, the and then Yoko had another child with another man from right. previous no, relationship. It was Sean it was that we Sean. worked on. Okay. And uh, so the uh, I'm a big Beatles fan, Mister. That's how I know. <laughs> that, yeah. Well, the uh, the producer. Uh, was the one that retained our services to uh, because the uh, the biological father took him and kidnapped him. Oh my! And 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 took him to all places to Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they hired me, and uh, I I got him back. I got Sean back and uh, to Yoko Ono, and but that was that was one of the little cases yeah but i've had so many that's a little case to him cases that we've had. <laughs> that's a little yeah i got john Lennon it's like uh, something on the side <laughs> uh how has the detective business or the private investigation business changed since you can use a computer you could do things you probably used to have to fly someplace you could right. just do it behind the well, screen we, of a computer well right? you should take us 30 days to uh search for someone mm -hmm. it takes us 30 minutes now wow. to locate the same information mm -hmm. so that's how uh technology has advanced it's also been counterproductive though because while it's made the everyday person able to to track people down friends ex-girlfriends classmates it's, it's conditioned the bad them. guys to track people down too. Yeah, it's up the bad yeah. guys too, but it's conditioned people to think that they can do a complex investigation for thirty nine ninety five. You know, pay thirty nine ninety five, and you yeah. can find them That's anywhere. Right. Right. So when you come, when they come to you after they've already done that or before they've tried that, and you give them, you know, we'll get people that think we're instead of private investigators, they'll think that we're uh, psychic detectives. I mean, they'll come and say, you know, I need to find this guy. His name is Robert. Um, I said, okay, well, what's Robert's last name? Well, I don't know his last name, but he drove a blue Ford. <laughs> well, do you have the license plates of the blue Ford? No. Do you have his date of birth? No. no. Do you have his social security number? No. So there's got to be a little bit of basic information to yeah. go on. And then you, you you quote him a fair price, and they said, well, I saw on Oprah that you can that I, I can find Oprah. it for thirty nine ninety five. You know? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. That's Doesn't not the way the that. business works. The <laughs> investigators uh, is a, a you can learn to be a private investigator. And uh, what is that course? How how long does it's it take? One to go? year. I wrote the course, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it takes one year, twelve months, and I I've trained people from all over the world. Can I get one if I go to if I if I were to take the course? Could I get one of those things like that shoots oil out of the back of my car to make the bad guys spin, <laughs> spin out or whatever? Now, I was you have one. machine gun in your car. Or did, two machine two guns. machine guns mounted have, in the right. I still have them. Oh my! That but, is some James Bond stuff. But right let me there. Tell you, <laughs> okay, I was crazy. the one that developed the revolving license plates mm -hmm. when they were shooting uh, Godfather. That's or not not Godfather, but uh, James Bond. Uh, they would come to me. The, the directors would come to see what kind of what kind of equipment do you have, uh, <laughs> Mr. Arms? And I said, Well, I have this what I have in my cars, revolving license plates. I have a you push a button and it shoots out a slick of oil. Yeah. So when they're following you, they would go all over the road. No Brilliant. way. And they I have a smoke bomb. You push another button, it shoots out a smoke bomb, clouds out a whole city block. We want that. We want this. So I'd give them the ideas, you know. And, we, <laughs> and the revolving license plate would, would if you had one license plate, you could push a button, it would flip it to would another revolve, license plate. It would revolve to Texas, uh -huh. I mean to New York or uh, another state. It, it was a triangle. I don't and know how much good that does when you're driving a Rolls Royce with machine guns on the front. Of it. No, no, but I, no, I had the other cars. my working oh, cars, gotcha. my working cars, my Corvette. Uh -huh. Yeah, and. And, and all that. But now, is that strictly legal to have a revolving license plate? On it your it car? is legal if you have the these plates of of that state. Ah, if you I have a vehicle see. registered in those states. Oh, okay. okay. Well, that's cool. But I, anyway, uh, I, I did. I thought it was 
kind of nice, you know. And uh, I have a, a camera in in my in the Corvettes where uh, the camera was shooting out the back, and it would bring uh, seventeen blocks up to 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 you on a zoom. Oh wow! Now, when 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 did you have that? Because that sounds like technology that was years ahead of its time. I was, time. and that was in seventies and eighties. Oh yeah, and uh, so I was before my time. I was the first private investigator in the country that could that had a telephone in his car. I went through all kinds of gyrations. Yeah, there was a guy that was on the board of AT and T here in El Paso. I never Joe Santos. Mm -hmm. He's got the big uh, uh, that, supermarket supermarket on uh, on Chelsea there and uh, Alameda. Uh, he, he was on the board of the telephone company. And uh, when when I went before the board, uh, they said, you want a telephone in the car? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> well, you know, you have to put up a bond. I'll put up the bond. And I was the first one to get it. It must have been so expensive. Need a break back in oh, those yeah. days. It must have been outrageously expensive to oh, get a phone was, in your car. Oh, it, now, now, anybody, first graders have phones in their pockets. Have, <laughs> that's right. Hey, um, listen, yeah. uh, uh, and cameras. Mr. Arms, thank you for coming in. There was a book written about Mr. Arms, and and they they do reprintings. I think there's a new reprint out. Jay, is that what you have over yes, there? That's correct. And a recent show that Mr. Arms was on. Uh, what was this? What was this TV Mysteries show? Mysteries at the museum. Mysteries at the museum. It's on now. Eventually, they'll they'll probably make a movie about the life of J.J. Arms. Uh huh. And uh, boy, that'd be one I wouldn't miss. I'd go see that. Absolutely. Just the stories. All right. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Arms, for coming by today. Thank you for having it us. It is so great to see you. It Thank is. you very much. Thank you for having us. We didn't even get to talk about the animals. We we'll don't. do that. We'll do another visit one of these days. <laughs> we sure we'll definitely will. do that. Thank you, Mr. Arms. Thank you, Jay. It's my pleasure.